Um, I have the pleasure today of introducing our faculty panel um, titled Behind the Curtain, sorry, there's a little bit of an echo, Behind the Curtain, Hiring Practices and Expectations. So I'm Jenny, just FYI, I'm um, she, her, hers. I'm a fourth year education student interested in feminist studies and linguistics also. Um, and I'm going to introduce each one of the panelists today and then I have a few questions to kind of guide our Q&A. And then, of course, I'll open up to this space and we'll have a conversation together. So um, the first person I'd like to introduce is Dr. Arthur Gross Schaefer sitting here. Um, Dr. Arthur Gross Schaefer has been a member of the faculty at LMU, Loyola Marymount University, since 1978. He previously served as both chair and co-chair of the Department of Marketing and Business Law. Prior to joining LMU, Dr. Gross Schaefer taught at Western State School of Law, Boston University, and USC. He has earned more than a dozen teaching awards and published over 150 articles. Anything you'd like to add to this? I write murder mysteries for fun. Okay, a writer of murder mysteries, very fun. Okay, um, sitting next to him on his left is, is Dr. Beatrice Deoka. She's a professor of psychology at CS, CSU. Turn that microphone away from that if you just step. Oh, singing. That, that might yeah, be singing. singing. Well, not okay. Oh, okay. There you go. okay. I'm in the middle. Sorry if I walk you. Okay. Um, pardon me, Dr. Beatrice Stoka. Is a professor of psych a psychology at California State University, Channel Islands. Is currently the chair of the psychology department. She graduated with a PhD in psychology specializing in learning and behavior and behavioral neuroscience from UCLA. She mentors undergraduate students in psychophysiological research concerning visual attention to emotional stimuli. Any extra caveats to add? Alrighty, perfect. Um, next to her left is Dr. Candace Wade. Dr. Candace Wade is a professor of English at the University of California here, Santa Barbara. She is also affiliated with the Comparative Literature Program. Her central interests include American literature and culture, African American literature, Southern literature, Native American literature, gender studies, and the visual arts. Any additions? I taught at a few institutions before that, but that's all fine. Okay, they great. Cover the, cover the bases the, for now. The, the fullness of the panel. Great. So. Okay. And lastly, to her left is Professor Dom, Dominic J. Dalbello. Bello. Bello. Bello is Professor of Engineering at Allen Hancock College in Santa Maria, California. He serves as a chair of the Mathematical Sciences Department, as well as faculty co-chair of the Institutional Effectiveness Council, and was interim dean for one semester. Professor Dalbe Bello was awarded AH, AH, sorry, AHC's, Allen Hancock College's, first outstanding faculty award in May 2006, and ASEE's PSW's outstanding community college educator in 2012. Any additions to this? Um, for transparency, I was yes. Lisa Berry's teaching assistant one hey. time. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I welcome you all here. Um, so we'll start with a few questions that we've received throughout the week and also just some questions that we as graduate students are interested in also that I've heard from people throughout this conversation today also. Um, so the first question for us will be, um, what do you all enjoy most, what do you most enjoy and what do you least enjoy about teaching at your institution? And anybody can start and we'll sort of move across there. Yes, they're looking at me. The lawyer's <laughs> looking at me. Um, so what do I least enjoy is grading <laughs> and actually assigning grades at the end when students who, especially because I'm at a community college, a transfer institution, the grades passing and failing, especially in that last semester, are going to be very critical for their future transferring and if they had only done one more thing or changed how they were studying and come to see me in office hours, um, that's what I hate. That's the toughest part. Um, the best part is, I, so I teach students who are trying to find their way and figuring out what they're doing. They're trying to get somewhere and when that light turns on and when they learn something and when they get accepted to UCSB or Cal Poly or wherever they're trying to get to, that's the, you know, they're growing up and we've done our job. Teaching a lot of people or learning and listening and learning from a lot of people. I, um, I ask the people who are working with me, I work with very strong scholars and I try to work in a very, uh, quite an egalitarian way 
with uh, the teaching assistants and other people who work are doing the work and I ask for those students to be identified because there's a moment where people have not learned to use gaucho space and it, or I call it Groucho space, and there's some other names for it, but um, <laughs> they have not learned that. And if you can catch that person, as many of the people that I work with do, before they fail, absolutely, because of something that is a shyness of pouring things into a vessel, that's, that's good. My favorite thing is seeing people and seeing them in the classroom seeing, um, having them ask questions and respond in large classrooms and having the students, this has happened multiple times at UCSB. Uh, I'll just give one example. Professor Wade, I have a 15 minute lecture on roadkill in, uh, in Grapes of Wrath and then figuring out how that can be framed and that person, or even the, the first year students in English 10, can prepare PowerPoints, have their parents come from out of town and give, have them give a, a co collective lecture together. That's the best thing that their people will have heard. So that's long enough for me, <laughs> enough for me. <laughs> uh, my favorite uh, things to do are, I, I love teaching. I love being in the classroom and that interaction with students. I love preparing for class. I love preparing new classes if I get a chance to. Um, so those are my favorite activities. Uh, mentoring student research also is definitely uh, a favorite activity. Least favorite, hands down, is being department chair. <laughs> I don't, I don't uh, particularly enjoy the administrative side of things, um, but that's about it. <laughs> so grading is what I hate the most. Um, but being a department chair where I can mentor new faculty is really high up there. It's a real priority. And doing creative things. I always like to try and change courses and see how can I make things more interesting and taking risks in doing so. Thank you. So because many of us are here and we're interested in these, the hiring process and the expectations of us um, being on the market, one question um, that is specific to this that we'd like to know is, what is the hiring process at your institution like and how does it vary by department? We understand that you've been faculty members for a long time, have sat on committees, so we're sort of interested on behind the curtain advice about this. I can start. Uh, we have a, you know, we're, we're in the Cal State system, so there's a lot of bureaucracy. <laughs> um, so we do have an online hiring portal that we use. There are certain, you know, sort of boilerplate language that we have to use. So we don't always have as much uh, freedom as a psychology program specifically necessarily to say, well, we want to hire this way or we want to hire, say, an associate professor or a full professor. That will, those things are kind of determined for us a little bit. Um, but we do, you know, so we use a, an online hiring system. There's, you know, the, a committee is formed um, of psychology faculty. Um, and then we screen. We look for, of course, making sure everybody meets the minimum qualifications. Um, and then beyond that, we're really looking for uh, individuals who we feel can be successful um, at um, our school. So we're, we're looking for that good fit. Um, from someone who, who we feel confident can be successful both in the, um, the teaching as well as the, the research components. Qualifications is, uh, and, and screening for qualifications is a really interesting point in all of this. And um, in the English department, mm -hmm. in Complet, in uh, American Indian and Indigenous Studies, uh, one of the things that we're looking for for our graduate students is that every one of, uh, the, I'm from the University of California, Santa Barbara, and I'm happy to be. Um, that what we look for and what is not to have people be somehow lesser when they leave here. We want our people that we, that come out of the University of California in any of these fields to have the number of publications, the number of talks, the number of opportunities uh, this is something that we're working on, and it's difficult to be teacher of record during the year mm -hmm. uh, so that we have a platform for our people when our people come out that they are, even though there's such a thing as interbreeding, and um, some departments don't believe in incest, uh, and other departments do, and other schools do, so that usually people are going out 
outward mm -hmm. to study with other people. Getting accepted as a graduate student here, if you're an undergraduate, is the eye of the needle. Mm -hmm. And if people have made it through that, it's, it's quite amazing. So it's the idea of qualifications. And when you, you say you, you look at it, I don't read the, read the letters of recommendation first. I read, I read a certain scan of what's there, and then I read the writing sample. And I, I read not knowing what institution the person is from. I try to read <coughs> not knowing uh, because that avoids class tracking mm -hmm. in every level. Good idea. Thank you. Well, other people do it as well, but okay. not at some schools. Right. Um, for us, uh, we, we get applications in and we read through them. And I think one of the most important things for us is having that experience in the classroom, being that teacher of record mm -hmm. somewhere. Because that's what we do at community college. We teach. And research is nice and important, but especially... So I'll talk about this a little later in my talk, but when you are writing for community college, if that's what you're interested in, and you've done a lot of research, that's good, but you don't want to emphasize that. You want to use that as a strength, perhaps, to say why you would be a good teacher. And you really want to try to get those instructor of record um, opportunities. So being a TA, I was a TA forever, and it was mm -hmm. great. Um, opportunity, great experience, but when the community college looks at that, they say, no, you were not the instructor of record, and, but I did more than what the instructor of record was doing, and no, you, you want to try to find those opportunities, whether it's at your institution or at a local community college. So for us, we're actually kind of worried when people apply to us from cold areas because they may want to be coming to California for other reasons like weather. And so therefore, we actually do hire for mission. It's very clear to me if someone has read about who we are and has not. If they've not done their homework, if they don't know who we are and our mission and we're looking for, we're not really that interested in them. We may want to find out and so forth. We also want to find out if they'll be a good colleague because these will be people we're going to be working with. And will they, will they fit in? Um, and, and also, will they be very good teachers? Will they care about students? So what I do when I was chair for 14 years, I would always take them out to eat. And I'd watch how they treated the waiters. Mm -hmm. Was there a sense of respect and honor? Now, I got that, by the way, from my reading about Einstein, who would take people out and order them scrambled eggs, apparently and then watch carefully if they put the salt on first and then taste it, or then taste it and then put the salt on. Not my test, because I'm not a scientist. But, but I really want to see how they treat people, people who they don't think they have to be nice to. Will they be there for, there for the students? I will look very carefully at the resume, not just on what they've taught and so forth, but what interests them outside. What's their passions about research? Can I maybe work with them? Or is there something outside activities that may be something that we need on campus or I can be excited about? I care about social justice very, very much. And so if someone is there about social justice, that's going to be exciting to me. So those are some of the things I care about. And I care about also when they teach that they're not dependent on their PowerPoints. Teaching is very important to me that they're there to relate to the students. So PowerPoints are important, but if they're just reading their PowerPoints, that's not very exciting to me. So those are some of the criteria. When we talk about it, we go through those things. We look at, do they, do they fit into our mission? Did they care about doing their homework? Um, did they send thank you notes? Or did they not send thank you notes? Um, did they know about us? Did they know about what, who I am? Or some of the other key people? So I expect people to do their homework because they really want to come to my campus, not just they're looking for another place that they can say, yes, I got accepted there. Yeah, thank you. Um, we actually had a question in an earlier panel that I think applies to, to this panel. Um, as graduate students who are involved with teaching and being a teaching assistants, et cetera, um, 
student evaluations play, we think, play a huge part in our um, evaluation as in our application packet, right? Yeah. And we're just curious, um, what sort of role do the student, students teaching evaluations play in getting a job throughout the hiring process? Okay. Uh, for us, it's very, very serious. We want to have a listing of their, of their, their teaching evaluations. And, but it's, but what we also do too is, can that person be helped? So we're willing to take somebody who may not be a strong teacher and mentor them. But we want them to be honest about their evaluations, what their challenges are, and can that person be worked with. And, the, and we will often take the risk if we think we can help that person. The mentoring role is really significant. And uh, I, I, when, people, when people are hired, and we feel that there is, I, I don't want to call it a deficit, but a need or an educational possibility. Uh, but one of the ways that people show that they're teachers, it, it's one in the question and answer period. Mm -hmm. There's the talk. There's the talk and, and, and the well-made talk and the talk that is done outward, the talk that sees everyone in the room and makes eye contact with everyone in the room. Uh, and then there is the uh, question and answer period. And to do well mm -hmm. in respect, in listening, in hearing what the, I'm about to say this, in hearing what the person is not saying when they're asking you mm -hmm. that question, those kinds of moments can win a job. Mm -hmm. They become, they say, the beauty of the question and answer period. Mm -hmm. And that's, a, that's one of the teaching moments, mm -hmm. I think, the showing that one listens and that one really responds. And with joy, which was the first question for this panel, the joyousness. I'm going to sort of jump off your okay. response. And I know the question was about teaching um, evaluations sort of as part of your application, which um, sometimes uh, shows up, sometimes is not at our institution. But at least in our school, I know in an earlier panel they were talking about what did you do to as a teaching demo or a presentation. <coughs> and um, different community colleges do different things. Some will make the teaching demo as part of the interview, so you have to pretend that the smart people who are sitting around the room judging you are a class and that you really don't know if they're testing your knowledge or if they are testing how you teach. At our school, we do a 20, 25 minute presentation of here's a class, this is the class, here's your topic. And we really want to see how you interact with the students. And after the teaching demo, then we ask the students, as when the candidate leaves, what did you think of this candidate was, were, you know, what were strong points? What were things that needed improvement? And then at the end we say, if you saw this person's name in the schedule, would you take their class? And, you know, that's not the only thing that we base um, our decisions on, um, but definitely if someone is, doesn't have a good vibe with the students, that is a big red flag. Mm -hmm. And you have to do a really good interview after if you're going to overcome that. Yeah, I, I agree with everything that's been said. Um, we, uh, we do something similar. We have uh, students um, in the room during the uh, presentation. It might be a research presentation. It might be more of a teaching presentation, but there, there will, will be a class of students in the room. And the best indication is when, you know, that candidate gets a question and they grab a marker and go on the board and just, you know, start explaining something um, spontaneously like that and really engages with the students and does that. That is really a good um, demonstration of um, what is really going to happen in the classroom. Um, and so we definitely care about how students respond to that, as well as that individual's just comfort with being able to spontaneously, you know, maybe address something that they did not plan on addressing during their presentation. Speaking oh, yeah. about, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Just, just a comment about your teaching presentations. Um, it was said in the previous panel, always presume things may not work, yes. like internet and so forth. Yes. So I always tell people, bring, bring your own stick, even if you sent it in, and also have a hard copy. Mm -hmm. Just in case it goes down, most of the rooms also have, you know, they, they have the, uh, the cameras. So you want to show that you're prepared 
for whatever may happen. Just to keep that in the back of your mind. I'm sorry. If the PowerPoint goes down, <clears throat> which it did for a full week and 1,004 gravettes, uh, I, because there was a mysterious communication between the back booth and the front booth, and it would only happen when I talked. And so Kerr Hall could not believe it. And finally, there were witnesses that came. But in, <laughs> yes, this was, this was last year. Uh, and they testified for me with the tech wizards. But meanwhile, to have the book or a text there and be able to say, uh, we, we're about to do a language battle and bring somebody up there to present a, a, a language battle from Zora Neale Hurston's Their Eyes Were Watching God, or a language battle from Faulkner, where there are two characters speaking, and you frame it as a play. That will help you. These are things that are part of the teaching process to be ready at the moment when the unbelievable happens. And my PowerPoints are not uh, living human pinned up beings. My PowerPoints are text. Their text, they're what the students used to bring into the room and still do in the courses on Joyce that are taught here for 400 people without a single PowerPoint by our chair and the Duffy with wonderful success. And he won the, the, the teaching prize for the, one of the major teaching prizes. And I'm, I'm proud of that. I just quickly respect, and you say you're supposed to treat the people in the room as if they're students. Those people are your students. I, I mean, I have to believe that as we look at each yes. other uh, and that I'm their student. And this is a question very quickly. I, my, some of my fields say that teaching is research and that research is teaching. And they're not just in some teaching stream job. This is a, a matter of, of deep belief. Mm -hmm. um, think, speaking from UC Santa Barbara, go, go ahead. Nice yeah, thank you. So I think at this time we're going to transition to oh, questions from the audience. Um, Lisa's going to be passing around the mic, so feel free to offer up any questions you might have for our panel members. Thank you all for being here. Uh, what are some of the common rookie mistakes that you see when people apply for jobs at your institution? I was going to say, um, not addressing the mission <laughs> is a big one. <laughs> not a, yes, yes, um, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, definitely uh, not addressing our mission, our specific mission, and then just our, our mission as a um, as a teaching institution. Um, in our case, so. the most hostile thing I ever said in a job interview to a candidate um, happened in the last five months, and the person just kept saying at Cal at Cal, at Cal, and it was worse than having somebody talk about their dissertation. I, I mean, I, I really, I'm, I'm, I said, you know, I really understand about the football schools. This was my aggression. All right, so comma, and then went forward. But it, it's that kind of, of hierarchizing that's not genuine, it's not respectful. Uh, and so the people, people who come who obviously feel they're too good for your job or your place, uh, it, it, that, that has a, uh, am I okay to say this? That has a stink about it that is actually perceptible. And, and I did not like it at the University of Alabama when people felt they were, they had, were slumming by having to come to Tuscaloosa, Alabama to teach me. I, I, I could tell that. Mm -hmm. in the classroom, and I was just hoping that they'd be able to go home wherever that was for them. <laughs> right, go ahead, I'm talking too much. To a cold climate, perhaps. To, yes, yes. <laughs> or if they came from a warm climate to a cold climate, you need to tell the students they need a winter coat because, uh, like uh, Pat Nixon, it could be a cloth coat. It, it, that's a famous line from history that you may not get, but People need to have real winter coats and be ready for the weather. The weather. The weather. Not not knowing the institution or the right. environment. So, um, I the mission, the mission of the college, um, mission of the institution. What are we here for? And not really understanding the demographic of the college because 
the mission is better be tied to the people we are serving and if they're coming in with a different perspective and they're addressing that in the interview or give us that vibe that they're not going to be supportive of our students there's you know that's or they don't appreciate where our students are at that's going to be a tough tough sell another rookie i think mistake is not to have questions mm -hmm. so you're going to see let's say 20 faculty whatever happens to be and you're going to think you've asked all the questions but when you come to see me as an example and you have no questions it tells me you really don't care about who i am mm -hmm. and so the easiest way to follow that to take care of why did you come here what's your story just a way that they're saying i care about you also eye contact um, someone is looking at their shoes all the time. I presume they're in engineering. Okay, that's a joke. Um, <laughs> but clearly not, not in law. But it's about the eye contact to say, I really care about knowing who you are. Because if what they're really saying is, for me, I'll be a good colleague. Mm -hmm. And that's important too. All of these parts talk about homework. I mean, they're about, they're about homework, but also relating yeah. to the institution. And so you know who's who's going to be on the the faculty and you know more about the mission yeah. and what what the beauty of what each level of education is trying to accomplish which is not always entirely practical but. um thank you for being here today i had a follow-up question regarding the mission um so what advice would you give to incorporate the mission in a way that's not just echoing? I know giving specific examples that talk to, say, service learning or examples of how you're committed to inclusiveness in the classroom. Um, but if you any advice you have on how to best incorporate that in the application so it doesn't sound like you're parroting what's on the website? Um, I think it, it depends on, on the, the mission. Ours, because it's a Jesuit university, though I'm a rabbi, I know, but it's a Jesuit university, um, we're very clear about teaching the whole person, about faith and justice, so forth. So to say those things, yeah, you're parroting. But to make sure that you emphasize some of the activities that may fit into that, um, that you make sure that the outside activities you may do that fit with that, that in your presentation, that you make some changes, just not not um, that that suggest that the course materials you're going to be teaching will include these topics but not just say okay I'm, do, I'm, I'm trying to cross a box but in my classroom because we're, we're not stupid so or okay <laughs> not too much but 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 when, when I talk about this stuff I also want to bring in current issues when I talk about let's say a law topic about um, uh, equal pay whatever happens to be I'm going to talk about some of the current issues dealing with women and other minority groups and so forth. And so, so by just by incorporating that in a more sophisticated way, you're getting the message across, not in a simplistic check the box way. Yeah, I agree. I think having um, real examples, and I, you brought up service learning, um, and I think asking questions about service learning. Of course, that is easier to do once you're on campus. But in terms of your written materials, um, I, I think uh, I'm highlighting the individual courses where service learning is either specified as a you know, part of the course or that is amenable to it um, and addressing those, in, those specific courses in your cover letter um, would be a good idea. So you know, dep again, depending on whatever the mission is, um, but that, that would be a great example of things. So connect it to individual courses that you would be interested in, in teaching. Look at the courses that are mm -hmm. there uh, that you could tweak and make your own and ways that you would make it your own. Mm -hmm. um, the classic thing to be asked, so you teach 20th century. Could you tell me what your 18th into 19th century um, American literature course would look like? And then that's, uh, and, and if uh, Lisa Berry and I were speaking about this, but the idea of having a portfolio in which you, and the, there are students in English right now who are going onto the market, mm -hmm. and I don't, uh, they are working on uh, what my Latin teacher in Central City, Birmingham, Alabama, calls syllabuses. She said she wouldn't call it syllabi, that that was fake Latin. But anyway, <laughs> um, I, and that there were other plurals, but that one was not. 
Um, so having, when you walk in there and, and you say, yes, I've seen, this shows that you care about the mission mm -hmm. of the school that you're coming to. I've seen this and uh, I have this and here is a dream course I have that fits in with your five other courses in this area because I see your mission, I see it structurally. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I see it. I think one more thing to add to like the example so that it doesn't look like it's a check off box. Yeah. It's, it's I've done this and then maybe a reflection on why that was important or nice. this didn't mm -hmm. work and this is how I would address maybe changing it. Not You don't want to spend too much on that but really yes I did this and then I'm reflecting on how I can make a better impact next time. There's the question, Did uh, why should we not hire you for this job? Do you have anything? It's, and, and the answer to that is, if you discover that I'm not the best person. Uh, so I just wanted to give you that one. <laughs> <laughs> because it, sometimes that's the challenge question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you all very much. This is really informative. I was hoping you could maybe talk a little bit about for positions that are um, geared towards teaching, how do you evaluate a candidate's research? How important is that? Are you looking for a balance or maybe speak to that? Wait, um, can, can you rephrase your question? I want to make sure that it's clear. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm in a very research heavy department. So yeah. a lot of what we're um, kind of mentored in his research and I hear a lot about when you're going out for research jobs you also want to present a very strong kind of teaching CV yeah. and I'm curious um, in teaching heavy jobs how heavily you weigh research are you looking for publications how many publications what's the bar I, I think again that's going to depend so LMU you were in R2 okay and so we expect good, really excellent teaching, good research, and service so across the board, 40, 40, 20, as was mentioned mm -hmm. be, before. But what's important for us is that we do not take teaching as a given. So when that person is asked to teach, and we really do, just like was mentioned before, we ask the students, how did you feel? What are their strengths, what are their weaknesses? We also often have a group of students just afterwards meet with that person and mm -hmm. ask questions. Mm -hmm. So we take that very, very seriously. So those are some of the things that we are looking at. We do ask for evaluations beforehand. Um, so obviously, so we're looking at the evaluations, how they, how they come across uh, when, they, when they teach. At, and, they, and by the way, we bring them into a class and we give them a topic or whatever they want to teach and then they actually teach that. So we get some real feedback. And then we have students talk, group of students meet without anybody else present with that person. So we get a pretty good sense of who they are and how they respect students. And of course, I'll take them out to lunch and I'll see how they treat the waiters. So we have all that. Okay. I love the taking out to lunch thing, see how they treat the waiter. I'm a big, big believer. People, people yeah. have, have become unengaged because of that and marriage. But it's a serious <laughs> thing. Yeah. Um, uh, so at a Cal State, it's, it's not quite 40, 40, um, 20. It's, we are a little more skewed towards at least you know hours per week spending more time teaching um and i gotta tell you i was in the same boat i w went through a very research intensive graduate program at ucla but i really wanted to teach that's what i really wanted to do um and so i was able to get a job at a small state university in new mexico um and um i think the you know, the, the, te the, the scholarship component um, for me always came together in terms of my scholarship um, being productive enough for me to meet uh, the requirements to be able to keep my job. <laughs> um, you know, so and that's one thing I think I mentioned earlier that when we hire someone, we want them to be successful. So we want them to be able to meet um, whatever the requirements are in terms of publications, as well as excellent teaching and, and service. But they have, to be, they have to be on that trajectory where every indication is that they will be able to be successful and meet whatever the number of you know, um, publications or however it is that it is measured, that they will be able to, to meet that in six years when it's time for them to go up for 
um, tenure and promotion. Um, and so, I, you know, and, I, and again, I, I navigated that same sort of pathway and, and um, pe different people will do it differently, but it does help to have some, pu some publications um, coming in. Um, so if, if you have published as a graduate student or postdoc, that is wonderful. It, um, it shows that you, you know, that's, I think that's really critical. Um, it would be a lot to ask an assistant professor at a Cal State to work on their first publication and, you know, start their um, assistant professorship. It'd be a lot. So we do want people to have um, a history of publications. We also want them, I, it'd be nice if they have some data sort of sitting there, if it's a data-driven field, um, because the first couple years can be, you know, a little, a little bit crazy. Um, and we want them to, very importantly, have a plan for how they will be able to accomplish their research goals, um, even though they're teaching, you know, nine or 12 units per semester. Um, so that's really what, you know, what you need to figure out, and it's gonna be a different answer for everybody um, as an individual, but if that is kind of the, the, the path that you're interested in pursuing, um, I mean, uh, that's what it ends up kind of looking like, you know, so develop a plan that it may not be the exact same type of research you're doing now, um, you know, we don't have an MRI machine at Cal State Channel Islands, <laughs> you know, so uh, my colleague that does that kind of, you know, research, she can still do that, but her bread and butter as far as scholarship it involves other techniques that are more um, um, doable at our campus. Take your joy and your life seriously, yeah. and there are two hours in every day. Uh, and there's also meditation and ways of thinking about things. Quality is more important than quantity, mm -hmm. unless you're going through the levels of promotion at the UCs, because anything that gets between covers is a book. Um, <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, that's, uh, th there's a way to say that in the opposite way. But meanwhile, if you were to imagine that this, was, this is career oriented, it's professionally oriented, but it's also going toward the stream, the teaching stream of your joy. And that teaching is part of your joy. And as one does that, either in the morning or the evening, two hours, one paragraph, uh, read it over, put it in the next manila folder. It, it uses paper, but you can use it over and over again in certain kinds of ways, and you read it through. And as Walter Mosley, the writer uh, from L.A., says, I believe it was, it, it's in the New York Times that he announced this, don't ever let your work get too far away from you. Don't ever let it become really foreign. Other people say, put it in the drawer and let it get cold. So you read it as if it were foreign. But he says, read your work every day. Be friends with your work. And this is not to judge you whether you're getting your paragraph a day done but it's to have that joy in what you've chosen to do in which the whole portfolio of a being is answered. Um, for community college, we really don't look at research, but so it depends on how the candidate really um, presents what they have done. And if you have a passion for teaching, that will come through. If that's the most important thing in your heart, that will come through in your presentation. So a lot, someone asked about rookie mistakes. A lot of it is, I have all these presentations and I'm applying to a community college and they focus on the presentation or the, the research and they have no idea what the mission is, who we're trying to reach. And um, so, but if you can take that research and connect it to why you are wanting to be a teacher. Um, even if it's in physics, right? Some maybe more abstract thing you can, or engineering, that's, if you can make it a strength, that's great. Partly because community colleges want to partner, you know, you're gonna be an asset to the school mm -hmm. if you have that research part of you because we wanna connect with CSUs, the UCs, private institutions. So we need to make that connection. You bring that as a strength to the uh, program, that would be helpful. 
having taught at all types of institutions I would I, that we're here among, the, the, you're, you have gifted, best, finest students anywhere that you would walk in to teach. And sometimes those people will be generation and a half. And when I'm marking those papers, I mark them for ideas because English can be fixed. But vapidity is much harder. Um, um, so uh, people have been asking about the uh, student evaluations for TAs. And I, um, I've heard statistics that um, both among professors and TAs that student evaluations for people in marginalized groups, like women, people of color, generally on average are lower, uh, regardless of the uh, TAs or the professor's teaching ability. And so I'm wondering how uh, the hiring committees address that uh, when looking at um, like evaluations from students and things like that. Um, that's not a major focus for us, in effect, because we really don't don't know. What we're looking for is are there major problems, and so that would be something that, if we see there are major problems, then that would be that would be a concern for us, and then we find out why. And you can also find out if someone's taking a course that's kind of unique mm -hmm. and they're willing to risk. Uh, that's exciting for us, actually. Oh, yeah. if, if they took a course that was exciting, that was going to be a hard one, and they, got, they didn't get great evaluations, but they explained, I tried something new. Mm -hmm. I want to see what would happen. We look at that as a very positive thing because we want people willing to take risks to do a better job and learn from it. Absolutely. Don't feel that we are ranking evaluations. Right. Yeah. Um, so it, it's not, we don't see it as a, that type of a very fine-toothed <laughs> measure. Right. Um, and, and again, I think looking for problems. Um, so uh, I know you could, you know, in doing reviews of files and such, um, the average number can be perfectly fine and great. And then I'm reading through the comments and a third of the class had the exact same um, issue. serious <laughs> issue with the class um, and that identifies a problem um, and so I think you know it, it's important to not get too caught up in like oh my gosh I'm a 4.5 on average and you know I, I might be competing with people who have a 4.7 average um, teaching evaluation don't worry about that um, so and do submit the the written comments I think um, uh, those are really uh, valuable What have been your struggles, and could you explain uh, the most difficult question or issue that came up in relation to social relations in the classroom? Be mm -hmm. ready for that question mm -hmm. if you're out for an interview. Yes. I mean, they, yeah, yeah, the challenges. The challenges we, we call it challenges. Yes, <laughs> yeah, we, we call, call it challenges. It's a, it's a challenge. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> What are the roles um, that a department chair does um, and is responsible for? And I'm curious as faculty members, why you've chosen to or been volunteered to go into administrative roles um, and then maybe kind of your back and forth with that. I think I missed a meeting somewhere and I got elected. Yeah. No. Yeah. Um, um, so in terms of the role of uh, a chair in the hiring process, uh, the chair usually uh, leads the uh, committee that is going to be hiring the person. So right now we actually have two math positions out uh, at our school that we're hiring to. I am an engineer, so I passed my responsibility on to a senior math faculty because um, it's their discipline and um, I have other things to do like come to this yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, in terms of being a chair I think uh, part of what motivated me was to take some leadership role in trying to make a better experience for the students mm -hmm. um, so I'm not, I, I, there's 14 full-time math folks in my department, one engineer, one computer scientist. I didn't think I'd ever be chair of the math department. 
but um, all of those students come through me and so sort of had to think I had a bigger picture of what was going on so I wanted to try to um, you know, move the needle somehow make it better for the students the and interact with other departments on campus um, bring a little bigger picture view perhaps to um, department um, so first of all so I'm I'm, I'm a, 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 the law side of our marketing business law so as a marketing professor I always had some of the marketing side as the person in, in charge but I saw my role constantly as trying to remind the department in a sense of what we're looking for. Mm -hmm. Looking for someone who's a colleague, mm -hmm. looking for someone who buys into the mission and a little bit larger type of a picture. I also saw my role of being with the applicants being very honest because I'd been there obviously a long time. Uh, and any question you have, and a lot of them for Loyola was, well, what's it like if you're not Catholic? And I went, you see? Okay. Um, <laughs> but, but also, you know what? You know what? What type of could they could they freely speak about the issues of abortion or gay and lesbian and so forth when it wasn't such? And I said, I do all the time. So so as make so as a, one who could really answer their questions in a very serious way. Um, but <clears throat> I think it's it's hard to be a chair. There are a lot of different competing issues, and people have asked me why was I chair for 14 years. I asked myself that same question. <laughs> but there was a reason. There was a faculty member who I thought was hurting other faculty members, was looking for reasons to have problems. And I told her, um, happy to be a woman, um, that she'll never make full well, as long as I'm chair. And she said to me, I'll wait you out. <laughs> she left in my 13th year. <laughs> You won. Because you won. I would, because I felt I was the last bulwark to protect the, the department. Wow, that's very honorable. Uh, yeah, so the I've grown a lot. I've been chair only for like a year and a half, um, or so. I, I, I have. <laughs> I, I have grown a lot. Um, it, it was never anything I particularly planned on pursuing or doing. Um, but you do learn a lot. You learn about yourself. You learn about how the institution runs. And it, it has, you know, you mentioned mentoring new faculty. And that has been really neat um, to sort of have just a, a little special role in that, <laughs> um, being able to look out for your faculty, um, be someone that they can come to when they have issues with students, issues with other colleagues, issues with, you know, different departments on campus, whatever it might be. Um, and, and be that supportive person, it's, it's really good. Um, I mean, on top of that, you do the schedule for psychology. That's, you know, we're a big program and that's big. So you know, plan the schedule, work with lecturers, hire lecturers, um, uh, get, thing, get our you know, new courses and such through the curriculum committee. And um, so you kind of help facilitate um, the realization of the dreams and aspirations of those around you, <laughs> right? So it, it can be very rewarding. It's, it's just, it's a diff it's a little different type of skill than um, you ever probably get at a PhD program. I'm chair of a stateless state, uh, American Indian and Indigenous Studies, and uh, I, I we got our first position this year, visiting wow. assistant professorship, and and we work as a collective, and we've worked for uh, a long time at this. And I would be remiss not to say that we're on Chumash land now. Mm -hmm. And I say this not as a piece of, I say this because the university was here 10,000 years ago. And there's so much, if you're in ecology here, there's so much you can learn from the winter harvest. Uh, mm -hmm. that, and there's so much that one can learn by being present with the people of the place and knowing that before you go there. That, not, that all types of people will be at the university and be ready to meet the, the smartest students you've ever had, and also people that are from the place, from the place. By the way, can I recommend a really good book to offer in your program? It's called The Rabbi Wore Moccasins, My yeah. First Murder Mystery, about a rabbi defending Native Americans it's been recommended to me and a murder. <laughs> I, I, I just feel I, I should have brought my book to be signed. <laughs>
Another question? Um, so I have a, hi, uh, thank you for coming here. I have a question uh, that came up earlier uh, among some concerns students had about being ABD and if that affects uh, their ability to be hired, does that negatively impact the application if they are ABD? Uh, for us, it, it's, it's not, not a major issue as long as we know they're moving on the process. Um, one other comment, by the way, unrelated but kind of related a little bit. Um, when you start to interview, if visa is an issue for you, and with mm -hmm. the current political state, we don't know what's happening, some schools are very supportive of taking people who have maybe visa challenges and are willing to work with them. Some schools are not. Mm -hmm. So you kind of want to find that out. And because um, I actually, I did research. I didn't know. I was doing research to find out how, how Loyola, and they were saying there are 26 Jesuit schools, by the way, and they communicate on good days. And on this one, almost all of them are supportive of helping foreign students feel safe and comfortable. Um, so just so you know, so that, but some schools are getting afraid. So you need to find that out if that's an issue for you. You see English and uh, the humanities, if you have by far the best work and it reads the best, uh, what you have done, then you, you, you can easily be hired. Uh, and I, I think that one of the significant things about about it, it, it's turning in good work, but when you're in the in medias race of life, uh, do you know how many months there are between whether you would be going to some kind of job talk or visit and the, the interviews at your major conference? You shouldn't stop working then just to go see them get a close relation with your mail carrier about whether you've gotten some letter or not. You should keep writing. You should keep writing and say, look, I have this period of time where I'm employed, but I still have these hours to, to write, to finish mm -hmm. the work so you, that you can be employed in somewhere in something that you enjoy. So a lot of us here are graduate students, and I was just wondering what you did when you were like at our career stage to, that really helped you get where you are now. Like what, what were the things that best got you to this position? I finished my dissertation. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I know. <laughs> I think I was filing on, you know, end of June and starting my job first of August or something. Um, I, uh, I applied um, uh, out of state. Um, so I was, you know, I kind of cast a, a wide net in, geographically, um, but I was really focused on, in, you know, teaching institutions. Um, I was really drawn to um, public institutions. Um, and areas where there was some diversity. So, you know, you got to find what, where your passion is. And I think, you know, um, uh, just show, be able to show in that application what you've done up until now that allows you to be a good fit. So being a TA gives you a lot of opportunities and different TA ships, you know, everyone's a little different probably, but if you've been able to, to work individually with students or um, teach a lab, um, section or you know whatever the the opportunity was where you were a little more independent I think you can really make a good case for how you are you know prepared to um, make that step you know everyone has to do it everyone had to do it and, and so when we look at your applications um, you know getting being ABD is not a problem um, at some point we might call your advisor to make sure that you'll be done <laughs> in time um, if it comes down to it but um, you know it, you, you're doing all the right things. Um, so don't, you know, you're, you're okay. <laughs> TA as much as mm -hmm. is realistic. Um, if you want to get into community college, go to the community college, get a part-time mm -hmm. gig there. Mm -hmm. um, I TA a lot mm -hmm. when I was here, I went to school here. Um, probably too much and um, well not too much in my perspective um, I taught at Cal Poly 
and I taught at um, Santa Barbara City, mm -hmm. um, ta taught at Hancock part-time. Mm -hmm. So, because um, that's, for a community college, that, that's what we're looking for. We're looking mm -hmm. for experience teaching at community college so you know what you're getting into. And, um, and learn as much about teaching as you can. Experience life, experience people. I think that's important. So it's not, you know, there's every there's a lot of people who know things, and a lot of people who get degrees, and a good teacher is more than just that. Mm -hmm. Two of my students uh, that I directed went as lecturers to two different institutions, and uh, they went as lecturers, and and they were appreciated so much that they were put on ladder track positions. So it's not always this kind of outside uh, game. The other thing that is practical and helpful, if you've taught 23 times, you've done a certain number of lectures, you're, you really have uh, presented uh, individual presentations and been able to be um, instructor of record. When you ask your, your professor, your teacher, your mentor to write about that, write the paragraph. It's a complex paragraph about your teaching, what you taught, and what you did. Your teacher cannot possibly write that for you. And after you've written that for them, you say, use one of this as you would like. But I want you to know that this paragraph is not replicated in my own materials. Yeah. Insert. <laughs> so don't yes, uh, right, huh? co copy, yeah. paste. Yeah, I, I always change to put, as you can tell, to put something funky into it so it will go along with the rest of authentic voice. But otherwise, we can't know what... what the we, problems, what challenges, what you overcame. What, 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 you, you what you've done and the c complexity. I, I, forgive me, Father, I have sinned. I've taught 80... So we have time for probably, TA sections. So we have time for one last question. Okay, and I just want to add to that a quick plug for the CCUT program, the certificate in college and university teaching. We have brochures out there if you haven't um, seen it yet. That's definitely something that helps distinguish you mm -hmm. on the job market, and it goes on your actual degree. So it's not a it's a formal certificate. Well, thank you. That was very helpful. I just have a kind of following a similar line of the previous question. So um, I'm a student in the STEM field in, at UCSB. So usually for people in STEM, the TA positions uh, focus more on like grading or um, office hour. There's less opportunity for teaching mm -hmm. compared to like the humanities. So um, in terms of preparing ourselves for um, to having more like uh, opportunities for like teacher of record, for example, like you mentioned, uh, maybe like um, teaching at local community college. I was wondering like from the institutions that you represent and similar institutions, it, what uh, kind of opportunities do you think there are for um, like UCSB grad students to um, join that um, institution and have that kind of opportunity? Well, we hire, um, uh, we can hire a, an ABD um, to teach a class, you know, as a lecturer. Um, uh, so I, I think if you look around, I think that's probably fairly common. Um, and um, we t typically do not hire people with uh, just a master's degree, but if you are, you have your master's, your ABD, and you're currently enrolled in your graduate program, that's kind of who we are looking for um, to, to teach. From my perspective, you're, it, it's a great matchup because you are, you don't realize it right now, but you know, you're probably at the peak of your field in a certain, um, you know, in a certain sense or pretty darn close, like in the next, you know, between now and the next five or 10 years, you're gonna, you, you're, you are um, really well educated in your particular field. Um, and so I see that as an advantage and I want you, you know, to be teaching our students. Um, and so my only question is, number one, is this something that's going to be helpful to you, compatible with you, and are you a good, you know, are you, uh, do you have enough experience, do you understand what we're looking for in a syllabus and grading requirements and those types of things? And if not, are you willing to ask um, the relevant questions um, to perhaps, you know, get to that point? Um, also, if, if you want to kind of break into that and you're finding that it's difficult, um, 
uh, you may want to um, almost shadow <laughs> someone. Um, so not just be a TA, but really kind of maybe sit with someone and see what it's like to actually develop the course, what goes into the syllabus, what goes into the assignments, what are some of the things, and maybe the, is it the C-tuck? C-cut. C yeah, maybe, some, may, I imagine that those are things that are probably covered in that program. Um, but, you know, that, I think that's one area where we're kind of hit and miss. We don't necessarily get much instruction in, mm -hmm. in how to build a course, how to build a syllabus, and some of those things. Um, and so I think mentorship can go a long way with that. Um, so if, if, I, if, I was if I was hiring someone and, you know, they wanted some mentorship in that, I would pair them up with someone who already taught the, co the course that they're going to teach and, and hopefully that allow for that mentorship process to happen. Can I, I just want to make sure I got the question correct. You're looking for experience before you go into the market. Yeah. Okay. So, so I, I don't know what, what the program is that they uh, have here. Um, like Loyola, there would be really no way to, to do that. We'd expect that, that you have that. Um, but I have had some, um, some people in, in, in PhD programs who have asked me, um, so people I don't even know, said, can I come and just walk and you know, go, go through with you a day of teaching mm -hmm. and just sit? And I've, I've done that. Um, and then when I've looked at their back, when I've said, would you mind, therefore, maybe teaching at, for, let's say, one of our clubs, something. Mm -hmm. And so I've worked it that, that way. So it may, but it means you have to be aggressive in making those contacts, making those mm -hmm. things happen. Um, there was a book uh, by, Prince, by Prentice Hall. Prentice? No, I'm, no, uh, no, 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 no. Um, oh, Pr Princeton Review of some of the best professors. It's, it's not an accurate book of the best professors. <laughs> I'm in there, but it's not, it's really not the accurate one. It really isn't. But, but it gives you their names and their bios, and those people who are in that book, I think, would be willing to do those stuff as well. So you can look at that wherever you're located mm -hmm. um, as, as a way to find out who they are or just talk with alumni. But most professors really love what they're doing, and they really want to help other people coming. So if I got an email or something else, I think I would, oh, I have responded. I think others will respond as well. One thing that needs to happen more here, there's something called associate teaching professor, or, or not professor, but associate teaching rather than a teaching assistant, teaching associate. And so what that means, it's a $5,000 commitment rather than a $3,000 commitment. But for that $2,000, we could be positioning our students in a much better teacher of record position to go anywhere. I, I mean, it, it is... It is a category that is an opportunity, and, and we all need to work toward that because what we want is our students to do well wherever they yeah. go yeah. and whatever they do. So. I was a teaching associate, so uh, I was sort of in my transition time. I got a peer, a teacher of record um, experience um, before I did my we're at the end of our talk, but before I did my real job search. So. Yeah. I, just, I do want to add a couple things to that. There is the California Community College Registry, um, which you can register and put yourself into an adjunct pool um, if you have the flexibility to teach at different places. And I think you can specify which colleges nice. you'd be interested in teaching at. Um, and then I also want to put in a plug for the School for Scientific Thought, which is sponsored by CSEP. Even though this is a program where you design a course for um, very motivated high school students, I think you could still spin it in your application materials that you have designed a course, which is a very different skill than you get from TAing. Um, and there's also a program called the SERA program, S-E-R-A. Um, I'm totally blanking on what that stands for. Can somebody <laughs> remind me? Anyone? Google it. Yep. Um, <laughs> thank you. Science Engineering Research Academy. I appreciate it, Wendy. So these are things that exist at UCSB that I'd encourage you to get involved with because I know that those associateships are much more rare um, on the STEM side. So with that, um, I'd like to give a round of applause for our panelists.